Okay, Mr. Eric, let's start with the big question. In what way is the international finance system rigged and in whose favor? Well, that, that is uh, quite the question to start off with. And, and certainly, I, I don't think it would come as any of a surprise to your viewers that uh, the, the system itself is rigged in favor of a supranational. I wouldn't say it's, it's rigged in favor of any particular nation state per se. But when you look at where the power structures actually reside, not where we're told they reside, but where they really reside, um, we have in existence on the earth today, as we always have, a financier oligarchy, which exists uh, in a with a power structure and a bureaucracy and a system of management above that of nation states anywhere in the world. Um, the, the creation of the modern incarnation of the uh, transatlantic centered financial system took on the virulent form of a cancer that we know and despise today, largely with the floating of the US dollar onto the, ex the floating exchange rates off of the gold reserve system in 1971 when a new paradigm was put into place that asserted without any evidence that the former post the former industrial age after World War II, where we were building big things and we were building our industries and manufacturing, that was the old wisdom. And that the new wisdom, and this is people like Henry Kissinger, George Schultz, a lot of the trilateral commission crew that came in with David Rockefeller's operation um, in the 70s, they were basically of the view that you know the new order will be based upon a consumer society. We will now just have services. We will begin to outsource our manufacturing sector to poor countries. We will load these poor countries with ever greater rates of unserviceable debts uh, on the one hand, while we do the same to the first world countries who will become more and more decadent by just consuming Walmart, you know, things from dollar stores and Walmarts instead of producing for themselves. And deregulation of the banking system will govern where money is accumulated from via speculation on the one hand, uh, which really took off in the, in the early 80s, but it began in the 70s. The merger of, you know, too big to fails to the, the creation of universal banking um, institutions that made speculation more and more of a driving force of the economy. So people lost a sense of where real economic value should have come from, which former generations understood. Um, which is the, the productive base of the economy. Infrastructure was also atrophied as we stopped investing in the longer term cycles. And so what, who benefited in all of that? Was it the United States? Not really. They were hollowed out and turned into a basket case, debt-based speculative bubble behemoth. Um, no poor country benefited for, by and large. So who did? It was an international coterie of financiers and middlemen who largely we we see operating in high echelons within the Davos crowd in the World Economic Forum, if you want to get a sense of some of the characters, at least as far as upper level managers are concerned. So yeah, it is tilted. It's a rigged game, but not, it's not tilted in any particular nation's favor. Okay, so what you're saying is that some sort of dark figures have really rigged reality in their favor against almost all of us. That's a pretty big claim. Could you please go back in time a little bit and tell us the history behind your reasoning? How do we get from point A to the awful point B where we're at right now? Well, um, I, I think that if, if you can't really answer the question if you don't look at intention, which some people say you're not allowed to do because that leads you into conspiracies, which is not responsible um, uh, scientific method. You know, we don't all all intelligent people know that there's no such thing as conspiracy. So don't go, don't bother going past that electric fence. Um, however, I think that when you look at history from a, a conspiratorial angle, which is the, the approach I, I take, and I, I think most of the responsible researchers that I respect tend to also acknowledge that intentions, goals and ideas that are either right or wrong shape uh, the waves of history. Um, much of the Cold War really, honestly, uh, shouldn't have happened. It did happen. But when you look at the type of momentum that Stalin, Roosevelt, uh, leaders in China were all creating at the end of World War II, at, when finally the Wall Street London funded uh, fascist machine was being put down, there was a, a vision of a post-war age of win-win cooperation that Roosevelt had negotiated with leaders from all over the world who were about to put into effect big projects, what some had called the internationalization of the New Deal, to help nations stand on their own two feet, liberate former colonialized nations. The Pan-African movement was, was driven by this, people like Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. Um, 
And it was only with Roosevelt's early death and the ouster of a lot of his allies, like Henry Wallace and Dexter White, who were all labeled red commies and they were crushed, that you had the creation of an Anglo-American alliance. You had the creation of you know the Cold War under Churchill's Iron Curtain speech. And a new dynamic uh, was put into place that was really bipolar and insane. But the whole thing was always based upon it was never really based upon capitalism versus communism. That was uh, largely a narrative that polarized people around a false, false dichotomy and had them um, essentially live in a world of mutually assured terror and destruction, um, which is where we saw in many ways the recapture during this period of nations that had fought for liberty in the past, like the United States, like many in Europe, um, and in the Western case, the, a big part of that recolonization of the United States happened through the mass deregulation of their, their banking system, even if it was the Cold War, that's, that's what happened. And it, it basically set into motion a process of privatization, every, you know, anything goes myopic social Darwinism that just maximized shareholder value, which we saw concentrated in the form of what happened to Russia in the 1990s under Gorbachev and Yeltsin with perestroika. Um, so Russia just got a heavy, a heavy dose of that um, in the early, uh, throughout the 1990s, which they're still recovering from, but it was something that had already been given as a poison to the West for a longer uh, period of time. But it was always designed to bring the world to the exact same type of place, um, which was ultimately the failure and breakdown of nation states and the creation of a new type of elite that would then manage a fourth industrial revolution or, uh, you know, the Alvin Toffler had called this the third wave. It had different names. Um, I, I tend to call it technocratic feudalism. Orwell called it oligarchical collectivism. You know, same same thing, you know. You've mentioned in your work that we're all heading towards a one point five quadrillion dollar derivatives crash. Could you please tell us about these derivatives? What are they and why do they have so much value? Well, this, this, the, the economy collapsed in 1987, um, in October. The, the stock markets collapsed by 25%. It was, by all intents and purposes, the, the cusp of a new complete breakdown, a new Great Depression. It was already overvalued in terms of financial speculative assets uh, by a fair, a fair number of, of magnitudes. Um, Greenspan at the time was the new governor of the Federal Reserve, the Oracle. And his approach wasn't to actually deal with any of the systemic causes of the breakdown. His approach was to instead um, normalize and accelerate the practice of derivatives trading, which had formerly been increased, generally seen as a dirty, quasi-illegal thing that many people like Michael Milken, uh, the bond speculator and, and junk bond trader, had gone to prison for earlier. Um, essentially, what is a derivative? So a derivative has a, a variety of species and forms you know, to these creative financial instruments, but essentially it's, it's taking debts, junk bonds increasingly, so debts that won't be paid, finding different ways of bundling them together and securitizing them as an asset in banks, putting insurance on them, and then speculating on the price of what the values of them will be on spot and futures markets. Um, so increasingly, you could essentially do this for anything. There's weather derivatives, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of things called weather derivatives, just to give a sense, have been created premised on the idea that, you know, let's say uh, uh, Pepsi shipments to Brazil um, next month will be affected by the weather. If it's cold, people won't buy uh, Pepsi so much. If, it's, if there's a hotter season than usual, they'll buy more Pepsi and you could buy a, a weather derivative based on what you think the weather is going to be. Um, and then speculate on those, creating what seems to be enormous amounts of financial value in on the books, which actually has no real bearing in reality per se, because you know it's tied to insurance, whether the insurance is going to be higher or lower. Um, or originally, when Greenspan normalized them, there were about three trillion dollars by 1992, which is already far too much. But this had grown in leaps and bounds throughout the 90s to when. Clinton took down Glass-Steagall, the, the separation of investment from commercial banking in 1999 as one of his last unfortunate, terrible acts in office. Um, they amounted to 78 or so trillion dollars. Very, very large growth. I mean, that, that's at that point outpacing the global GDP. Um, by the time that the first wave of the blowout happened, 
in 2008, they amounted to about $740 trillion approximately. Today, it's very difficult. There's even professional economists have a difficult time mapping out exactly the number of how much derivative, how much of these derivatives exist in the system uh, today. The, the number, the, the estimates w fluctuate widely between 1.5 quadrillion to under a quadrillion, but it's, it's hard to say because they're so opaque and hard to define. Um, one thing is for sure, this is far more than the global GDP. Uh, the amount of debts, whether it's in uh, commercial real estate, whether it's in still um, subprime mortgages, which are still a thing uh, that was never properly resolved, uh, whether it's student debts, whether it's, I mean, there's so many forms of debts, national debts that have been securitized. And there's so many points where you could easily see very quickly a default that happens in one sector, which would then spread and cause a mass deleveraging where all of the leverage, the derivative leverage and speculative leverage upon the debt bundles will disappear up in smoke when people thought that it was just that debt disappearing. No, it's not just the $24 trillion of, of COVID related debts incurred by nations over the past one year. There's much more built on that in terms of speculative assets. And this is all fictitious capital that's been accumulated to try to project an image of economic growth, wherein the reality is that there has been zero, neg there's actually been negative growth over the past 40 years of just atrophying of the real physical economy. And when I say real economy, I, I mean the thing that sustains human life, agriculture, industry, infrastructure, science, and technology. Those things have been atrophying in favor of just growing rates of monetary claims that only exist on paper, but not in reality. And, that, and that's the time bomb. That's a time bomb that has been nobly created. The effects of it were always understood, even going back to the 70s when the de deregulation began. Uh, people like Paul Volcker, uh, who ran the, the Federal Reserve, was talking about a controlled disintegration of the world economy um, as a good thing. So <clears throat> the, the effects of these sorts of processes have been known. And um, that's why I think of it more as a time bomb set to detonate at a certain pinprick moment in a similar way that the Great Depression was initiated in 1929 or the you know, Weimar hyperinflation earlier. Um, so yeah, I, I just say it that way. Well, I guess I should have gone to an Ivy League school instead for finance. But anyways, so if we are heading towards some grand financial collapse, when is it going to happen and what is it going to look like? Yeah, sure. Uh, so for the first part of the question, we're sort of, it's difficult to say, you can't really give a date or a number because in many ways, when you look at the system as a, as a dynamic, as, a, as an organic process, we're sort of living on borrowed time already. There is the element of human free will um, and perception, um, which is not really tied to objective reality always, um, which is a factor in this. It's not the only factor. In fact, reality does exist. And it's sort of, I think to myself, sort of like the, uh, you know, the view of uh, somebody who might have jumped out of a tall building and for a while they might perceive and believe that they are flying, but the reality is, is quickly, uh, you know, racing up to them on the concrete splatter below. Um, so <clears throat> we have, we have some indeterminism as well. Uh, the future itself, like there is, there is when the system does collapse because it, it can't really do much, but collapse, there's a fight over what the reset new system is going to be. Um, so that, that sense, it's underdetermined. We don't know the date. It could be triggered either the way the Great Depression was triggered by a willful calling in of broker call loans, which would result in a mass wave of uh, bank panic and uh, defaults, which would then deleverage the system in the same way that it happened in 19, 1929 with the shock, you know, the emotional, psychological uh, shock onto the people that would render them more malleable and uh, accepting of fascism as an economic solution. So there's that aspect. The other, but the, the question is, will it be, um, and we could talk about this later, I won't, I won't go into detail, but will, will the new system be premised around the unipolar rules-based order, sometimes it, it had formerly been called the new world order of what you see coming out of the likes of Klaus Schwab's mouth and others? Um, or will it be a multipolar type of system founded upon nation states cooperating on building big projects for the future? Um, so there's just that question too. I don't really know the date, um, and I don't think anybody can really know the date that the system itself will, that the, 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 the tsunami will hit. I do know that the shockwaves have, there's precursors. I think that in many ways it did happen. 
the, it blew out already in 2008. And we've been living on, like I said, borrowed time. It's been a bailout system ever since. <laughs> well, as someone who lives in Russia, I can tell you that uh, among the more sort of intellectual type of person, which who knows, maybe I'm one of them. Um, there's this uh, belief that it's really good that Russia has very little national debt, if anything. Uh, Russia's pocketbook is balanced. But when you tell that to people, their reaction is, well, if Europe had to go into debt to live so well, then we should do that too. If, you, you know, in America, who cares how much debt they have? No one can stop America, and Americans live so much better than we do. Debt is awesome. So, Mr. Arendt, I kind of don't know what to tell those people. Uh, do you have any suggestions? Got any uh, good uh, arguments I could borrow? Okay, yeah. So that's a great question now. Um, I understand where you're coming from, Matt Moore. And for that answer, I think one has to look at um, anti-inflationary versus inflationary debt. So not all debt is created equal. Um, let's say, you know, as a, as a small, low-level example, let's say you are a farmer without the means to buy a tractor, but you have knowledge and you have uh, initiative capacity, you know, you're, and so you'll, let's say you take out a debt to buy a, a tractor and, and equipment for your farm. Um, th that will, by, by having deployed your new and improved uh, equipment, you will now imp improve the bounty quite a bit of your, your agricultural output. And within a very short period of time, you will produce more than enough ample um, abundance that will eliminate the debt you incurred for that legitimate purpose of buying the tractor and, and doing the other thing. Uh, let's say you have a gambling addiction and you're, you know, and, and heroin, uh, you love heroin and you start, you know, uh, selling, <laughs> not, you start taking out debts to service your gambling addiction and your drug problem um, to the point that you start, you know, selling off your kids for organ, you know, organ transplant use to, you know, get more money as you, as you extract wealth from your household uh, to feed your addictions. Um, yeah, that might, that, that's a very different type of debt. That's, that is a self-feeding debt that will only grow monstrously as you decay on a physical and moral and intellectual level to the point that you die. Um, and I think that that on a macro level, we could see that played out historically in different times and places in different nations that have behaved like the, the first example where a debt has been occurred, <laughs> like, for example, under Franklin Roosevelt and the, and the New Deal projects for, you know, things like the Tennessee Valley Authority involved incurring sort of forms of debts, but they extinguished themselves quickly. The, the, the illiteracy went from 20% in 1932 in Tennessee to 80% illiter uh, literacy, sorry, 20% literacy in 1932 to 80% uh, literacy in 1950. And it became a hub of aerospace engineering from being like a Beverly Hillbillies backwater hub of racism and ignorance uh, before things like the rural electrification projects were built. Um, so Again, I think that part of the problem with, with the thinking of certain people that you, that you illustrated in, in Russia and, and elsewhere um, is that our school system has glossed that over increasingly over the past decades. We don't, we, we're, we, we're sort of taught mathematically to treat all debt as created equal. There's no such, debt is a debt is a debt is what we're told. It's all the same number, but we're not looking at the physical processes, the qualitative processes that are behind the numbers, which are just shadows of something higher. Um, so, you, you know, I think that it's great that Russia doesn't have the debt that many of the Western countries have, but it could also be much more, I mean, compared to like, let's look, look at uh, Russia's beautiful relationship with China is great, but I think China has gone further to demonstrate what, um, a strong, uh, a, a much stronger approach to physical economic development than Russia has. Uh, and I think Russia is learning from that, increasingly looking at the Belt and Road Initiative, looking at these, you know, I mean, it's $3 trillion of investments into the real real economy that China has, has launched. In large measure, I think, just to have a quick segue on that, I think it's because China's Gorbachev, I, I wrote an article on this a little while ago, China had their own Gorbachev problem in the form of Zhao Ziyang, who was the uh, the head of the, the Chinese Communist Party from 1987 to 89. He was sort of Reagan's darling, and everyone was celebrating him as the great liberalizer of, of China. 
Um, and for a decade, he did a lot of, of really terrible stuff. Like he brought in George Soros. He ran a think tank with George Soros. Imagine that, right? The head of the Chinese government running a think tank with George Soros. Um, he brought in Milton Friedman, um, Samuel P. Huntington. All of the Western liberal uh, thinkers were brought in Alvin Toffler into China, which were brainwashing big stratas of the intelligentsia of young people, especially in China, who are then getting these Soros funded scholarships to train in Harvard and Oxford and other things. So anyway, um, China at a certain point was smart. They caught on much more quickly than the Russians did of what was happening to them. See, Gorbachev was, was at the same time preparing the groundwork for something similar. Uh, so in China, when uh, Zhao Ziyang was discovered to be behind uh, the Tiananmen Square uh, program, which was supposed to be a color revolution regime change, where Zhao Ziyang was supposed to come out as the hero of the people against the big bad uh, communist party, um, there was a much wiser clampdown. He was put into house arrest where he died 16 years later. His allies were either arrested or they escaped through Hong Kong triads uh, with the help of MI6 and CIA operatives after uh, Tiananmen Square into the United States, where they remain today um, an anti-China resistance movement from the outside. I think Epoch Times is, is covered with these guys. Um, and then China held, held control. So they expelled Soros. China banned Soros forever from, their, from operating within their jurisdictions. Um, they kept a hold of their... their a national central bank. They didn't allow it to be privatized the way Russia did and the way many countries did. I think they're the only country and they kept control of, they kept a separation of their investment banking from commercial banking. So where other, other countries have had that destroyed, they kept that, which allows for, you know, people will go to jail in China for doing the type of investment banking activity on, on derivatives and speculative activity that we train our young people in Harvard business school to, to practice when they, they go to work in Wall Street. One of the claims of your work is that the nations that support a multipolar world order are deeply fighting and engaged uh, in this battle to get rid of the rigged financial systems that you've been talking to us about, which sounds all well and good. But on the other hand, I mean, China, Russia, these countries are really deeply ingrained into the international systems that we're all accustomed to. And uh, if you've ever gotten the chance to listen to uh, Russian bankers talk, oh, they're very happy with their globalism and their liberalism and their big systems. So are you absolutely 100% sure that there really is a fight for a truly different multipolar economic future? I mean, there's things I, I don't, I have not mapped out. And, and I think in many ways, you, you'd be in a better position to, uh, to answer some of that. But I, what I do know is that, you know, every country has elements of deep state, deep statism. <laughs> there's no, there's no country that, that has completely cleaned house uh, fully. China has, has done an enormous amount of work at trying its best to rein this thing in. And, and I mean, a lot of uh, deep state operatives have gone to prison over the years uh, for corruption charges and other things, but that's a fight underway that's still there. Um, Russia has had obviously its own cleaning house that Putin has has waged now for a number of years. There's still problems, and I think that you you find influences because of the 1990s destruction of so much of Russia's economic sovereignty. There's still a lot of problems, and there are liberalizers who have been strategically placed throughout the Russian bureaucracy, and many of them you will find in Russian finance. Um, permeating the walls of things like the central bank, but there's there's patriots, nationalists, as well as traders in varieties of these institutions. The IMF still, I think, partially because there's there are uh, there there's things that that China was able to do that Russia wasn't that allows the IMF to still exert a certain amount of influence over the Russian economy, uh, which needs to be broken away sooner than later. Um, I know that on a physical economic level, the integration with China's Belt and Road Initiative and, and the Eurasian Economic Union that Russia leads is vitally important. The uh, Polar Silk Road, which is integrated increasingly uh, with both rail and maritime corridors around the Arctic Passage, um, has integrated with the uh, Far Eastern um, Siberian and Arctic vision but that Putin has been really championing, which is really good. It's a whole new blossoming of, of investment corridors that are very long-term, very high-tech, very good stuff. But that being said, um, there, there is still um, an inability to emit the type of long-term credit through a central bank the way China does, or its, its state banks in Russia. So 
I don't, I don't know a lot of this stuff, but it, it is certainly good that we do see a de-dollarization. So um, on the one hand, Russia has been threatened for years by being you know, kicked out of the SWIFT payment system. In response, they've created with the Chinese an alternative payment system uh, which allows for transactions to occur using Russian rubles or yen or, uh, or even euros. Um, increasingly, Russia has gone for a gold-backed currency, and currently their gold reserves are more than the U.S. reserves for the first time in a very long time. Um, Gazprom is increasingly being de-dollarized de as well to allow for trade you know, with China in Chinese yuan or rubles. And there's a variety of things like that. You know, their their sovereign wealth fund has been Russia's sovereign wealth fund has been de dollarized too, which gives them a certain amount of liberty. But to go further to that next phase of long term credit emissions, like I said, um, the way China's done and the way the U.S. had done when it was acting like a sane place a long time ago before we were born, um, they're still far from that. And I don't know fully what the details are. So, could you tell us what are the new Asian Investment Bank and the BRICS-led New Development Bank? And more importantly, why are they so important? But uh, the AIIB and the, the New Development Bank, uh, indeed, are two very powerful, potentially very useful instruments for uh, leading the world out of this sort of unipolar cage, which has been run for about 70 years by technocrats managing the IMF, the World Bank, and uh, City of London financial sort of control centers. Um, the, the effect of the past 70 year system has been just completely destructive. Uh, trillions of dollars, you could say, have in accumulation been emitted by loans to poor countries through these, these Bretton Woods organizations. But despite that, what we have seen is a destruction of the, the recipient nations, those lucky enough to receive those loans, um, have been have had their ability to stand on their own two feet. Um, not, not only it it not only has failed to service their needs, but it has crippled them even more than they were uh, 50, 60 years ago. Um, and that largely has to do with how things like conditionalities were programmed to entrap nations into ever increasing rates of usurious uh, interest rates. Um, the conditionalities, as we've seen from John Perkins' work on Confessions of an Economic Hitman, um, were designed to ensure that countries in Africa or South America would never be allowed to use the loans for building infrastructure uh, that would benefit their own country or, or industrializing their own country. It would always be premised around the idea of wealth extraction, using foreign corporations to exploit their, their nation without any of that benefit coming to the people or raising the nation's to a status uh, that would really improve the nation as a whole and it's standing as a sovereign member of an international community. So that was consciously destroyed. Um, China, when it created the, in 2015, the AIIB and the New Development Bank, which was part of the BRICS uh, at the time, Dilma Rousseff uh, and Jacob Zuma were still uh, parts of the BRICS um, of South Africa and Brazil. The idea was to create new mechanisms outside, so, so that the IMF and World Bank wouldn't be the monopolies of credit uh, emissions. And instead, these, these new organizations would be designed to emit credit um, at very favorable interest rates, at very long-term conditions uh, for nations to develop full-spectrum economies and stand on their own two feet. Um, now, unfortunately, the, I, the new development bank has had some setbacks, which again, I don't fully understand, but they, did, they have not yet met the challenge. Uh, only $30 billion in six years has been admitted, um, which is not very much compared to what they could feasibly do. The AIIB is much better, but even there, there's strange things. Uh, a lot of their credit has been put into investments into green energy grids and things that don't really benefit the productive powers of nations. There are good infrastructure projects, but I think that the most valuable projects from the BRI, the, the New Silk Road, are coming out of China's state banks, especially the Import-Export Bank and other uh, members of the state bank community. The AIIB still, I think part of it is when you look at some of the, the vice presidents of research and planning are uh, British lords and knights, which is a very strange thing. So there's, there seems to be elements of infiltration to subvert these institutions, which is a fight. 
Uh, the good thing is that the AIIB never gave, they allowed everybody, originally it was 56 nations, now it's up to 103 nations who are participants in this. Um, it's open for everybody to join, but only Asian nations are allowed to have dominant voting rights. Other countries can invest, so you could be a, a Wall Street financier and you're allowed to invest in it, or you could be London, you know, Honorable Iago London, and be an investor in it. And at least in its constitution, you're not allowed to be a dominant voter in it. You're, you're, you're always, you, you're never going to be allowed to make the rules. You have to abide by the rules that the, the Chinese and their allies in Asia are setting, which is the right thing you want to do. Um, the New Development Bank, so again, that, that could easily become an instrument of amazing uh, growth, poverty alleviation, and progress for around the world. Uh, the other thing is the New Development Bank recently this week has now ushered in members featuring uh, Uruguay, the UAE, and Bangladesh. Um, so it's growing. There, there seems to be something in the works that could help this take off, along with things like the Contingency Reserve Agreement, which is a $100 billion fund created along with the, the New Development Bank to provide a buffer from speculative attacks on economies. Um, so that, that's also good. Now, over the years, I tend to write about geopolitics and ideology and the media. That's more my specialty. I don't claim to be some sort of economic expert, but I've had the chance to talk to many of them. And they tell me that the Russian ruble is a cheap fiat currency, totally dependent on Washington, or should I say, totally linked and dependent to the Fed. Is there any truth to this Federal Reserve System connection to the ruble conspiracy? And if so, why hasn't Russia, after all these years, rid themselves of this dark tie? Um, I could say a few things about that, but I'm sure that there are other uh, specialists who do a much, much better job than I would. Uh, the, uh, I could, what I would bring up are a few anomalies. Um, and, and, and like I said earlier, that there is still a huge amount of influence that the IMF and the Western financial centers have over the Russian economy, especially through the central banking system that was privatized. And much of it, there are liberal, uh, unapologetic liberal infiltrators within and embedded still within um, some of the, the power centers of Russia. Some of it is, you know, you'll find some of it in Moscow um, around the mayor. Um, <clears throat> but again, I don't want to go into too much detail there. The oh anyway the um, the fact is though that there has been an obvious de dollar like the Russian the Bank of Russia has slashed 101 billion dollars of U.S. dollar holdings, uh, 50 percent of their U.S. dollar holdings since 2013 have been slashed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the the gold has now become a greater I think 22 percent of the reserves are in gold, only 22 percent are in U.S. dollar reserves. So they're they are diminishing that. And at the same time, increasing things like the renminbi, which has gone from 5% reserve holdings to 15% in a very short period of time, um, which are all very, very good things. Um, their, their export to other BRICS nations has gone from 10% US dollar, hold, or it's gone from 95% US dollar um, emissions in 2015 to now only being 10%. So high reduction there amongst other BRICS nations. Um, the, the inability for Russia to emit long-term uh, credit for big projects that transcend even a lifetime or two, uh, the way China does, is still a bit of a mystery to me. What is holding it back? It does seem that there are maneuvers being made um, um, by people like uh, Mikhail uh, Misustin, to, I, I don't know if I pronounced his name right, Misustin, <laughs> um, Misustin, thank you to bypass some of the old school channels and uh, emit credit for the big projects like the opening up of the, uh, the, the Arctic development, uh, highways, uh, you know, uh, communal infrastructure, uh, new cities, five new cities are gonna be created as was just announced a couple of weeks ago in the Arctic. Um, so th there are th ways that these things are being financed that are, are breaking from the, the trends of the past 30 years, but I, I, there's I, so many blank spots I don't fully understand, so I'll have to reserve my, my overall judgment on things. Do sanctions, the kind that have been put on modern Russia in the last few years, do they actually work? Have they been effective? If so, and especially if not, does that say something about the state of affairs in the West? I mean, the sanctions they put against the Soviet Union, to an extent, well, partially got the job done for sure. 
Well, I, I think that a lot of this has to do with, with Russia and increasingly the, the greater Eurasian partnership, the multipolar alliance having created um, a viable alternative financial architecture, um, which is br bringing in increasingly old civilizations that had been abused and manipulated into the mix. Um, so Russia is harmonizing its, its uh, energy uh, grids increasingly with Iran. Um, Iran has, has joined the SCO, the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which itself Russia is a leading figure behind. And together, Russia, uh, Iran and China have uh, put online a $400 billion investment strategy over, over a variety of things, energy, military affairs, economic development. Pakistan is on board. India is on the, which has been walking in two worlds, has increasingly gotten in, more and more on board with the multipolar alliance. Um, Russia is just seeing a different market, a different community of collaborators that are actually trustworthy. And for the first time, we have whole stratas of civil great civilizations creating and working together with a common win-win orientation strategically, which we've never really seen in history this way. There's always been usually like one or maybe two nations who try to take a stand one or the other, sometimes together, but rarely, who are easily picked off by the powers of the private financier wealth uh, managers and oligarchs who control intelligence agencies and many other things um, who undermine the, the, the good. Now, for the, we have such a, 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 I mean, an amazing confluence of nations and they're all like, even India is working on massive investments into um, the, the Russian Far East. Um, so is Japan, even though both India and Japan have been induced to be anti-China on a variety of levels, they're both integrating with something that China is also a part of with the Polar Silk Road. So you, I think you just have this confidence in the future and a capacity to carry out uh, development outside of the, um, the power structures of the West, which have completely, I mean, lost validity. People are looking at the West as a, as a giant Titanic basket case, um, throwing around a lot of big words and threats, but I mean, they don't have a lot of means to carry out much since the, the U.S. bubble is about to tank. Its debts are unpayable. Its population is committing suicides at greater rates in history and doing drugs at greater rates in history. Um, so it's not really easy to take that thing seriously at this point. It is dangerous because they still do control a vast amount of military equipment and nuclear weapons. So, you know, a wounded beast is never a, a safe thing to be in the same room with, you know. On a personal note, could you tell us about why you decided to start the Canadian Patriot Review? And could you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I began it officially in 2012 in the summertime after a few years of conducting research and doing political activism in Canada. Um, it was very, it was just very difficult to get any traction with uh, meetings in Ottawa with with different members of parliament or getting the population to to really understand anything about strategy, economic strategy or anything like that. Um, so part of it, I, through discussions with colleagues of mine, uh, I came to realize that a big part of this is psychological and is built around the fact that nobody really knows what the hell Canada is. We're operating in this strange thing that looks and sounds a lot like the United States, but really it's a monarchy and it's the only monarchy of all of the Americas. You know, I'm wondering like, why is it that there's a governor general? Why is it that there's these lieutenant unelected governors in each province? Why is there a privy council? Why are all these things in place in Canada, which is not very democratic. Um, it's very strange. And you know, we sound and look so American in many ways. We all watch the same Simpsons and TV channels, uh, but yet it's a very different culture where the Canadians seem to be almost overall proud of, of being anti-American. That's like one of the only distinguishing characteristics. But when you try to like ask, well, what makes you Canadian? It's very difficult for Canadians to answer that without being a negation. Like we're not American. That's why we're Canadian. Or maybe we're polite or we like hockey or maple syrup. But that's not the foundation of any national identity that's worth anything. And even when you ask our look into our, our, our national flag, you know, every national flag of every nation means something. The colors or the images symbolically mean something of relevance. In Canada, it's, it's, it's a maple leaf, which means literally what it symbolizes is a maple leaf. It has no meaning. It was created in the 60s as sort of a, you know, um, a way to brainwash people or convince them that they're not British somehow. Um, so there was a fake nationalism that was created as social engineering. And part of the work I did um, with the history project pulled together an image of what the real history was going back to the 1770s, why we failed the Benj Benjamin Franklin challenge to, to be the 14th colony to sign the Declaration of Independence. 
why, why did we fail to accept that challenge? Ben Franklin was up here organizing. Um, so we filled in that story. We filled in why did Abraham Lincoln's allies during the Civil War who were in Canada occupying very powerful positions, why did they all fail to succeed in their program to make Canada independent after the Civil War? Um, why were they ousted, in some cases killed? Um, what was that all about? Why was, you know, and this tied increasingly into a global chemistry, a picture, a drama that was taking form regarding why Brit the British Columbian um, annexation movement to join the United States, because it was an isolated colony on the West Coast. Why did that fail? Why was it subverted? And why were the plans to link up a rail from the United States, the Lincoln's transcontinental rail? There was a plan underway to bring it up through British Columbia, through the newly purchased Alaska, which Abraham Lincoln's allies around Alexander II had uh, just recently sold to the United States as part of a larger program of breaking imperialism. And the idea was to connect rail all the way from the New World to the Old World through the Russian Far East, uh, through the Bering Strait, and into Asia. Um, there's maps that were created in the 1880s, 1890s on this. Tsar Nicholas II even commissioned a, a study on building the Bering Strait rail tunnel in 1906. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the problem was a lot of the Lincoln allied Americans were shot. Um, whether it was McKinley, whether it was Garfield, whether it was Lincoln, um, whether it was McKinley's uh, vice president, um, there was a, a high density of assassinations, both of American leaders who represented something good, as well as um, Russians as well, you know, Alexander II, Alexander III, Nicholas, obviously we know the story, but there were a lot of uh, leaders in Russia, as well as in Germany, um, as well as in France, Sadi Carnot, the president, was assassinated around this time, all run by British intelligence, which just like today had an international network controlling cells of terrorists, at the time it was mostly anarchists, um, deployed in across Russia, across the United States with Emma Goldman that killed McKinley. Um, again, it didn't take a lot of, it didn't take that much work to discover that it's a British coordination in the, in the, in the center of the node, then as is today. Um, a colleague of mine of ours, both uh, who had written for strategic culture for a long time, uh, Martin Seif, has done incredible work on, on a lot of this British control of anarchist terrorist cells. Um, which think that they're operating independently, but are actually always coordinated from the top. So anyway, um, that's what got me started. And I found that there was nobody to publish my, my work on. So I was doing this research and finding it very difficult to get people to read it. Um, magazines, even in Canada, that were alternative media didn't want to touch it because it challenged too many axioms and assumptions about what Canada is that people felt too strongly about. So I decided to that point say, well, I'll just go it alone. And, and with a few colleagues, I, I created uh, the news magazine, the website, and we began just publishing historical research and, and geopolitical analysis from a global perspective. And we situated our, as best as we could uh, Canada within that, that context. And uh, that, that's going strong to this very day. So what does the financial future of your homeland of Canada look like? And how deeply is it tied to the monopolar world? Oh, we are. Oh, yeah, it's, it's quite. I mean, if if the multipolar alliance hadn't formed um, and done battle for the past seven years, I'd be a much more depressed person and the world would probably be a much more hellish place. <laughs> if Putin had not intervened in Syria, if the, the Belt and Road Initiative had not been launched and other things. Um, Canada is a very controlled environment at this time. I mean, there have been uh, sparks of light throughout history. Even in recent times, we had momentums at different moments going back to 2011 um, to open up the Arctic for real development with an orientation towards Eurasia. Um, we had, uh, even now, there's still a little bit of resistance on an economic level coming out of Alberta, which, uh, you know, Donald Trump, before uh, he was, and I'll just say it, before he was ousted in a coup, um, there was a massive amount of federal U.S. support to build a rail line going from the U.S. through Alberta into Al Alaska, uh, based upon uh, an economic model of uh, exporting various goods, minerals, natural gas, and other things to the Asian uh, markets. So it was, Trump is blamed for being purely anti-Chinese, and I think that he did fail and became very much influenced under COVID to the anti-China narratives of Steve Bannon and others. But that project was a big, a big way to uh, integrate increasingly our interests with those of the Eurasian development zone, which currently we are being told is our 
arch nemesis to be destroyed and feared at all costs under a new Cold War. So currently, I don't see a lot coming out of Canada as far as leadership is concerned or ideas. Um, I do see a lot of technocrats like Christia Freeland, who is our deputy prime minister and an Oxford trained uh, Rhodes Scholar, who uh, is being set up to increasingly... I mean, I, I think she's the power behind the pretty boy image of Justin, who really doesn't have much substance beyond it just being like a teleprompter pretty face. And Mark Carney, who is currently busy planning the COP26 summit in, uh, in London or in the UK, in Scotland in uh, November, he has made it known that he is very interested in being set up as the new prime minister of Canada sooner than later um, under a great reset sort of operation. So his, his colleague uh, at the F, the not, I was going to say the FSB, it's, it's not the FSB that we all know. It's, it's the Financial Stability Board of the Bank of International Settlements that regulates international derivatives um, is a Mario Draghi, who's also a former Goldman Sachs man. So they work together um, managing the derivatives time bomb. And uh, now Draghi is also a, a, a trustee of the World Economic Forum of the Great Reset Orientation and is the head of Italy. He was installed there as a technocrat to manage uh, its transformation under the Great Reset, Carney will, I think, increasingly find himself uh, set up in a similar position in Canada as the storm increases, and it will increase. Um, we need desperately, I mean, the, the, we need to get the biggest, the biggest challenge that Canadians and Americans have is this belief that Russia or China or both are our biggest threat, which is what we're being fed every day in the mainstream media it's very bad brainwashing and people are not looking at who are the real the real power structures that today as well as in the past have continuously worked to subvert and destroy humanity's interests and you know and uh so we we definitely need something that brings us into an alignment um snc lavalin there's private sector construction firms and others who could offer a lot to the development of big projects. SNCF Lavalin was, you know, it's a Montreal based firm. It was working closely with Libya to build the great man made water project until that was destroyed by NATO. But we have these, these capacities to offer the world development assistance. We have a lot of resources in the Arctic uh, that are untapped for imperial reasons. Um, this all needs to be, that needs to be changed. And, and I don't see that changing in the short term. It, it, there's too much baggage currently. So I don't know. I don't, I don't have an optimistic answer for Canadians watching this right now. I'm sorry.